Welcome to the second episode of the Play Fast Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Mack. Today we got a special guest that we're going to interview, and it's a friend of mine, a business cohort of mine. He started off as a teacher, moved on to become an AD, is now a principal um, at, uh, at a school in our county, uh, Mr. Martin Aftuck. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Am I the first guest on this thing? Uh, technically, you're the first guest because Colby Grant was the first co-host with me, and he's the editor, behind-the-scenes guy, so technically you are the first. Well, I'm assuming they're going in alphabetical order, then, if it's me. So. Yeah, uh, it, I go by first name, so M is not. Uh, okay, never mind. All right, so it's not alphabetical well, order. Thank you, for, thank you for having me. Good, good choice, though, good choice. So um, first thing we got to do, we got to give, uh, got to give a couple shout-outs to our uh, Tier 2, Tier 3 Patreon members. So we've got to give a shout-out to Matt Bajork, Travis Kohler, Ken Case, Jay Klinger 9, Martin Ricard, Jason Smith, Smitty, Anthony Borden. All right, appreciate you guys watching. Uh, appreciate you guys being members and uh, contributing to the Play Fast uh, Patreon site so that we can continue to uh, get to better, uh, better podcasts with better quality, better cameras, better mics, better setup, better videos, everything we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to take to another level. So by you guys being um, Tier 2 and Tier 3 members, we really appreciate it. So hopefully you appreciated the first podcast. Hopefully uh, you'll appreciate this one. Hopefully better guests, too. Better guests will help a little bit. Now, now Martin, me and you are known um, in some text threads. We're known to be a pretty good faction. There's been some legendary heel and face turns. This is a straight shoot interview today, so there is no faction. There is no heel face here. Well, I'm glad nobody will be listening to this. Then, yeah, so, so <laughs> be glad that right now there's not enough I'm of our text already, people. I apologize. There's, there's uh, not enough of our text threads on here to know that we are actually doing this together, so there can no longer be heel turns in a thread because it's like when the guys in the, in the territories back in the day used to ride in the same car to the territories and everybody knew that they were working a match that night. So kayfabe, now everybody knows that this is a straight shoot interview. It's not a, a, a heel turn or a fake. There might be one during the interview. We don't know. We'll find out. We'll, we'll find, out. find out. Well, I appreciate you having me on it because I'm always excited to come back to Orange Park High School, home of the Raiders. Yeah, spent and ten, uh, spent ten years here, so it's a since home away from home. Since we talk about that, uh, you know, the segue into that is you were the one that hired me here. Um, Going to get into that a little bit, but the first thing I want to get into is how'd you get into education? Where was your start? So I was a uh, I went to the University of South Florida as a freshman. I wanted to be a, a doctor in my mind, supposedly, and then I got a D in chemistry, so I had to change really quick. And, and uh, I was Good always choice. into sports. Uh, I wasn't the best athlete in high school. And, uh, but I you know, played a bunch of sports at New Super Beach High School, uh, and then I, I actually I coached swimming when I was when I came back to community college my sophomore year of college. So that kind of got me the, the coaching uh, bug a little bit. Uh, then I came up here to, to UNF as a junior. Uh, one of my friends worked at Lakeside Junior High as an intern, yep. and she won the her and her husband won the lottery, like the twenty two million dollar. Lottery. Being friends with Martin Aftuck or the actual yeah, lottery? To what, yeah, oh, the actual okay. lottery. Okay. So she told she wasn't gonna have a she wasn't gonna teach at that point. She got a her and her husband moved to Gainesville. She said, "Hey, there's this job at Lakeside Junior High. You should look at it. It's gifted social studies." So but you're still in you're still in college. I'm still I'm finishing up college. I'm working okay. at Red Lobster, uh, you know, trying to figure out what I want to do. I interned over in Jacksonville, and they were kind of taking their time on the interview for the process. So I ended up. Coming over to Lakeside, interviewed, got the job, and, and then I taught at Lakeside for four years. Coach was the head baseball coach, coached uh, football, uh, soccer, a couple other things. But you know, it was a good experience. Being 22 and then going in as it, it's a, it was perfect for me to go into junior high. Yeah, I don't think you know being 22, 21 year old going high school high, level would be going tough. into high school level, especially. I didn't, you know, I wasn't like a college athlete coming in. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a good segue. Kind of got my feet wet. Learned, met some great people. Learn from some great people over there. And, so, and, uh, so with that being said, when you when you got your first kind of uh, glimpse at coaching in um, in community college, or when it, did you figure out kind of from then that if you thought maybe you were going to coach education or teaching is probably the best way to do it, or were you going to teach either way? I, I was, at that point, I was going to teach either way. I was not. There's a reason I'm I'm pretty good dealing with the kids I deal yeah. with because I. You know, when I got my, I was able to talk myself out of a lot of trouble when I was younger, um, but, but you know, got to a it's point. It's a skill. I was a, not the best student, but right. I had like a three point nine GPA or whatever. I mean, it, it just came easy to me. That, then I went to college, and um, 
you didn't have to go to class. Yeah. So I mean, like my first, I remember my first test, and I took out college algebra and trigonometry combined. My first test, I got, you know, I got like an 85 or something. I'm like, well, this is cool. And then I, I don't think I came back to the next test. Didn't work out for me. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up, you know, flunking out of that. That, but I mean, failing and, and, and not doing what, I, not doing the right thing there kind of helped me, you know, learn that, learn that everything, you know, if, if it's given to you and not yeah. earned, then you're, you know. Well, it's kind of the same deal. I, I, you know, we talked about it last week. I started as a freshman on the golf scholarship, and you know, golf at that time there's six or seven guys on a team, and you're traveling all the time to these up in New York on Long Island. I was traveling in the fall when it was still warm enough, and I was going to Jersey, and I was going to Maryland, and constantly missing classes. And then in the spring, you pick up again, and you play the actual real golf season, um, and traveling and missing classes. And at that time, nobody told you, hey, they really don't take attendance when you miss a class. It's kind of on you. And I was on a full scholarship. And so when I transferred to St. John's, after that first year, only 18 of my 30 credits transferred. So, you know, I, I kind of figured out the hard way that there's got to be a better way to go about this. But I had switched majors three times before I, my third criminal justice was my third major. So I started business and then only 18 credits transferred because I wasn't going to a lot of classes, playing golf and doing other things. And then I get to St. John's and I'm political science and I find out that I don't like that. So I end up going criminal justice. And even at that time, I had no idea uh, what I was going to do. Luckily for me, a friend of mine went to law school at Michigan. Mm -hmm. And I was playing my, my fifth, fourth year of football at St. John's, but my fifth year in school because of the first year I had playing golf. So it was a kid that was my age from high school, a good friend of mine. And he went to the University of Michigan and was taking law school. And luckily for me, he was able to tell me the things he had to do at law school. So that knocked law school right out of the... Yeah. Right out. I said, there's absolutely no way I can do this. I, I don't have the discipline. Um, so I had to figure out what to do. Uh, bounced around with the possibility of playing in Europe for, for a little while with a team in Finland. And not the CFL, none of that. It was just... Would have been an extended way to figure out what I was going to do with my life. That fell through. So I went back to grad school and started coaching at the school I played at at St. John's University. And, and uh, so at that point, I had to figure out what I wanted to do. And that's Congratulations where, on the... You yeah, the, a, yeah, I just got... Uh, you got a big award this week. Yeah, I just got uh, a Lifetime Achievement and Coaching Award from uh, the alumni group of St. John's University Football, uh, who does not play football anymore. But it's still pretty cool to go back and see some old friends. And um, So I'm glad you brought it up. I don't like bringing those things up. But uh, we... Uh, had to figure out real quick, what am I going to do? Coaching is really cool. I better get into education. So then I got my master's degree in education. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of how it went. So you start off, you're teaching, you're coaching, you're learning the ropes, you're young a little bit. How does it escalate to becoming an athletic director? So I, I would come up here to Orange Park and watch uh, baseball games, varsity baseball games. They had a really good, really good staff. Um, in a really tough district. I know you've made fun of it before. We talked you know, yeah. in our personal lives. Toughest it, district in the city. It was a pretty tough district. Uh, but we had some good, we had some decent players. We had some uh, decent coaches. But the, uh, Michael Johns was the head baseball coach here when I when I first. Uh, in the league now, right? He is a roving, or he's not, excuse me, he's a field coordinator for the Tampa Bay Rays. Yeah, he's, he's been, been with them the, for been with the Rays for a, for a long time. From Orange Park High School Baseball, which currently, you know, we've been struggling at this school. Uh, with our baseball program, but people don't know enough about the history of it. They, you know, this place was actually really good at one time. And oh, guys, yeah, some great coach. John Chapel was the head coach. Yeah, John Chapel's also awesome a guy. ton. Um, a few other guys. Sid, I think Sid Roberson. There, there were a few other players. That Fred Matricardi. Fred Matricardi was a, is a, a current coach at Uly High School, district winning coach. One at so Fern so Deep over Lit the time, at, you guys were together Baker, at uh, Baker, Baker County. County. Yeah, and over the time, those guys have won a lot of games, done a lot of things. Guys in the major leagues, and so. You know, it, just, a, just an interesting tidbit in, in high school sports, the way things kind of go. You know, now all of a sudden we're struggling, and this baseball program used to be pretty darn good. Well, I think that's a lot of it's got to do with your, and that could be a whole other philosophical discussion, but the changing demographics yeah. of, yes. of the areas. And, you know, everyone, New schools opening. Everyone yeah. moves further south or moves further west, or you have, yeah. you know, you've got a, a, a country club across the street that no longer has a golf course. Yeah. Um, so that's going to, you know, that's going to hurt in the long run. But th there was some really good... Uh, there's some good sport, good sports that took place here. Um, when I came when I came aboard, I, I assisted Michael Johns. I was like a JV assistant, and helped out when he when he left. I took a varsity assistant role. Um, but I co I mean, I was just always trying to do something. Yeah. 
I did. I, co I helped coach girls soccer. I helped coach. Um, but when I you coach say golf, that, I mean, I coach. But it was when you say that, and and you're always trying to do something. Do you really have any idea what an athletic director does? I would watch your, your current principal, Clayton Anderson. I'd watch him, and he, the guy, was a machine. He was up here all the time. I mean, and we, and uh, you know, we'd give him a hard time about it. But the guy, he, he truly. Truly cares about this school, yeah. and he. You can see it as a when he was a teacher and football coach. You can see when he's an athletic director. Uh, certainly, as the principal now, you can see what you know he cares about with the school and, and the, the legacy he has. Uh, certainly, one of the, the nicest guys I've ever worked with. But you want to talk about somebody who cares about kids? I would watch him. Uh, the guy painted the Raider Dome by himself one weekend. Yeah, <laughs> you know he just like people. People have no idea when you talk about it, and that's one of the reasons I you know. I, wanted to bring you in as one of the first guests on, on the podcast was, you know, most of the people that are going to watch this podcast know me from Play Fast Football. They know me as Coach Mac. They don't know me behind the scenes, but they just know football, and, and they probably know how much time and effort I put into football. But talking about aspiring in your career to do other things and a former athletic director, people have no idea what an athletic director really does. It, is one of, it was one of my favorite jobs. I uh, had a hard time, especially, you know, and I'll say it, I left Tom here hanging. I left coach. I hired him, and then I left. Like I think we got through spring football here's, together. Here's where the heel turn yeah, comes. We got through spring turn. football, and then I, I called him one afternoon. I was actually on the mower and let him know that, hey, I just I took an assistant principal position. Uh, it, one of the first phone calls I made, it was tough, but you know, the, going back to kind of what you were saying, there's a lot. People don't realize the amount of time that athletic directors spend at a school because you work. You know, you got to be here seven all the time, seven to three or whatever. And then, and then, you know, if you really want to be good, you you've got to be around. Yeah, you're got to be around for see. everything. You're the yeah. answer to every problem. And I was one of, the, and I still am. Like, I'm just one of those guys where if I'm not here, I don't feel comfortable. Yeah, and you don't trust. You, you, you it's know. not that you don't trust anybody. I just if something's going to happen, if someone needs my help, if, let's say yeah. a coach has this, you know, coach needs something, you know. I'll, my wife gave me the biggest ration of crap. Uh, my set, my, my last daughter was born. Um, the you know the, the field drag out there. Yeah. I won't name the coach. You know he's still here. He's been coaching here a while. But he he was texting me pictures of the field drag where a piston had exploded out of the yep. side of it. Yep. So I'm you know I'm, I'm sitting there texting Wait. back during labor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for, sorry, Reese. But during yeah, labor, not, not, uh, I'm, I'm I'm sitting here thinking like, man, what can I do? Oh, this sucks. What am I going to do to help them out? Because yeah, and what's going on is actually pretty important too. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not not that you're in control of it at any point, but there was you know there was a birth going on and, and whatever. But yeah. uh, so I mean, field's got to get dragged. So so it, just from that standpoint, like people really have no idea. It's the same thing with coaching. I get all these young kids all the time. I want to be a head coach. I want to be a head coach. I said, well, why don't you look into it? Because I really don't know if you want to be a head coach. It's more than just calling ball plays. No. It's more than so. As an athletic director, and you have aspirations. Yeah, I want to run an athletic program, and you know, I, obviously, like everybody, I want to move up the chain. You know, you don't want to stay stagnant. Most people in their career, but when you get in, like I, I really don't know if a lot of people understand what it is when you get in. And it's not. It's. I don't know, it's a great job because you have an effect on so many kids. Yeah, everything you get to help, it, and it's perfect. I mean, the perfect job for being a principal. For me, was was you know managing that athletic uh, program. Yeah. Treasure Pickett, the principal, she, I mean, she told me you're the principal over athletics. This is your program. Right. So I would try and, you know, I try and keep things off, uh, keep things off their plate. We have we had a great, you know, we had great coaches through here. And it's, it's and so it's you know, it's a natural progression. It's a logical evolution of things. So you have some success as an athletic director here. Things are going well. You want to be in administration. You want to keep moving your career your career along. So at the time. When you left, you were taking a step up, which people don't understand. You know, now obviously it was it was important to me who was here when I interviewed for this job. I chose not to interview at other jobs because of the people that were here. But this is the perfect time of the year to talk about subjects like this because you just watch what goes on in college. And you watch, as we get into the NFL, you watch this time of year with the hirings and the firings and you see where people are going and who's moving. And at a certain point, you know, you have to look out for yourself in your career to take care of some things to move forward. And it's hard to make those decisions because you know there's some other people that either you can't bring with you or, you know, in the college world, there's guys that they have to let go because it's you or them. Choose. Um, so, you know, people don't understand that, that the higher you get in, in rank and all these different things, and 
it's never happened to me as head coach in high school football, you know, knock on wood, thank goodness, and hopefully it never does, but there's guys in college football that are being told, let's change the offensive coordinator or you go. Now, if that guy's your buddy, what are you going to do? Well, in college, it's pretty easy because those guys are making what, – what's Willie Taggart making to not work right now, like $14 million? Yeah, and obviously the buyouts and everything else. Well, I get all okay, that. Like Mike Norvell just gets hired to be FSU's yeah. coach. And he has never been to Tallahassee, supposedly. I mean, that's something I read. Yeah, That possibly. was like the first time he's gone. Yeah, possibly. Could you imagine – and I'm a Gator fan, so I'll – We're going to talk about that later. But, but as far as could you imagine taking your wife, kids, family, and saying, hey, we're moving to Tallahassee. I know you've never been there. I would imagine at that point – because Mike Norvell's been around the block, even though he's only 38. Um, great hire, in my opinion, by the way. I'm not an FSU fan or a Gator fan. I think it's a great hire. But I imagine at that point there's got to be some type of trust factor with the people at home to say, all right, Dad, you, know, you went from here to here and made more money. You went from here to here and made a lot of money. Now you're going here to make a lot, a lot of money, and this could be the, the, the – defining moment of your career. So there's probably got to be a lot of trust, but I agree with you 100% that that life is just, as a family man, is just absolutely chaotic. But the point this, I'm making this is... This life is too, though. No, this life high, is high more school, so because you make less money. High school is crazy, and especially as the athletic director, that was hard when I had hey, young, You never see your family. When I had young kids, when <laughs> I had, you know... <laughs> Your she, wife wants she to know did well during labor. I don't know how the uh, <laughs> the piston made on the on the field drag, but... We still have a drag, so we're okay. Yeah, we're okay. But, you know... It was hard because I would leave. You know, they wouldn't see me a few days a week. Yeah. My wife was having to do it on her own. She was, she still is a nurse, but it was tough. And I, I take it for granted now that I'm, I get to, you know, get off work around three thirty, four o'clock. Yeah. But it is. I'll never forget one time my wife, one of my one of my first jobs. My wife said, "You guys are one and eight. Why are you up there seven days a week, ninety hours a week?" I said, "Because I'd like to go two and eight, not one and nine. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to go one and nine. Yeah. You know, and, and that's also part of like." who you are and how you do things. I only know one way to do things, and, but that, that is a legitimate question. Like when you have a family and kids, and I'm never there. I, I'm, I'm rarely, especially during football, I'm never home. Yeah. And then in the off season, Thursday night, I got to sell tickets at a basketball game. We got workouts going on after school that I'm now delegating some things to some other people so I can get out of here and kind of relax a little bit before weightlifting starts and other stuff. So it, it's... Well, then you got summers. You're you're 11 months, but still you're working 12 months. It's 12. It, everybody knows it's 12 never, I told my... I'll never forget because I... There's these moments in life when you sit, when you verbalize something, and you get to see someone else's reaction. So yeah. I'm explaining to my wife. First summer we started dating. You know, I, we are. I think Fred had scheduled like 95 doubleheaders or something. We did in the win. summer. Yeah. But we, hey, we it was summer baseball. Yeah. We were trying to get better. Got to so do it. They don't get it. Hey, but I'm explaining to my wife, and she's or the girlfriend at the time. Like, well, yeah, we you know we got we get here at eight o'clock in the morning. We get the field ready. We play games. You know. Double headers in the, in the morning. Because the question I imagine is, what are you doing there all day? Oh, no, no, no. It's like, well, when do you, how much do you get paid for this? I'm yeah. like, well, I get a supplement. Yeah, that's a good one. And, and I'm sitting there, and I don't realize how silly it sounds. Because when you're in it, boy, you are in it. You, it is, this is when what you're talk about do. the we're economic gonna, side and the time, gonna, and you try and explain that to your significant We're getting these kids ready, but then I'm explaining to her, like, yeah, well, I get a supplement. And I'm looking at her like, she's crazy. Yeah, we're banking. You know, and I'm, I'm working... <laughs> 80 hours a week. During. I'm getting $1,300. We are yeah. killing it. So when you divide that time up, people don't understand. And I, and I think our county and in, in, in general, you know, they're trying to do some things to help out coaches in the summer because it, it's a lot of work. But people expect it too. If, and if you're not doing it, you're going to be behind. Yeah. And then, you know, it's just it's just part of the business. You want to get better. Yeah. It's what you do. But ex again, explain to her like, yeah, we're, we got 85 doubleheaders scheduled. I'm working, you know, five days a week during the summer for free, you know, you kind of you kind of sit back and think like, yeah, this might be a little crazy. Yeah. Other counties, I think, have a little more. But then you also don't, at the same time, you sit back and say, I don't know another way to do it. Yeah. So, so um, you know, in, in, in kind of, you know, you're looking at that and you're dealing with that, now you got to figure out, okay, I am doing a lot of work, don't really make a lot of money, is this the route I want to go? Is that when you start thinking about maybe the upswing of, of where am I going to go from here? Is there is there another direction or something else I can do? Because in, in our world that we live in, in education and athletics, you got to start thinking about your skill set and start thinking about, okay, what else can I do? I now have kids. What else am I going to, what else can I do? You know, what am I good at? What can they pay me for to make more money? So ironically, I started my master's probably, it actually started my master's before. I stopped coaching my last, um, I think it was two, three, 
probably the, the, two, the second or third year before I went to became the athletic director, I stopped coaching baseball. We had a, a change, and it gave me an opportunity to kind of step back and work. I was working on my master's. Yeah. Um, so when Ms. Pickett hired me as, as the athletic director, you know, I was still working on my master's at that point. Yeah. I got it done, and then I kind of just took my sweet time with the field. Yeah. With getting that done, because it's a t I don't know if it's, it's tough. It's, it's a tough, tough process. Time. I got really good at section two, uh, <laughs> put it that way. But anyways, so you know, you're you're sit. It's just it, for me, it was a matter of, of time. You know, put yeah. my because where I, are you putting? Where you put your time? I love this job. I love taking care of the fields. I love coming up and, and working on those things. And then um, you know, this this place is is different because you have a. You know, it's been around a while, and, and you really to to be here at Orange Park High School for that long. <laughs> And um, you know, there's just a lot of passionate people here, and you, you know, you really take things to heart here. And, and what you see a lot of kids that need a lot of help. Yeah. That, that wouldn't necessarily, they would not have that, you know, if there wasn't a Tom McPherson in their life, or a Rob Garcia. The the greatest thing about that, and, and I've always kind of, you know, chose jobs that way. It's not a turnkey operation. No. It is not something that you know whoever walks in, me, you, Colby, next guy, you know, step in and it just runs itself. And there's, depending on the type of person you are, there is a certain sense of gratification knowing that you're at a place that needs that kind of help and you're not at a place that when you leave, somebody else comes in and they do it just as good if not better than you. Yeah. You know, and I, I was talking to somebody the other day about the Rutgers job and, and Greg Chiano when it first came out and it was eight years, 32 million. And, you know, we were talking about it and I was making a joke about it. I said, yeah, for, for eight years, 32 million, I'll, I'll go to Rutgers. And, and, and the point I was trying to make was, regardless of what you think of the program, I'd rather follow somebody at Rutgers right now than, than follow Nick Saban or Bill Belichick. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's a job that's going to be tough, you know, or follow uh, Dabo at Clemson. I'd rather, take, I'd rather go to a place that's not turnkey and say, hey, look, I have a chance to make a difference here. And what I do makes a difference. You know, what's the sense of going somewhere? Yeah, winning's fun and, and all that, but everybody else has done it too. Now, I can't say that for Dabo because he got Clemson back, you know, and, and, and better than it's ever been. But just as an example of using certain things. But Dabo, Ohio, Dabo in, this, in this day and age with social media, there is no way he makes it up to, the, to get to the point. I, mean, I don't know if any of them do anymore. What did, he, what did he go, three or four years with a loser? With a, yeah, I don't know because some of his recent interviews, you could see him starting to do some things. And, and I don't know how long he makes it, but he's doing a great job. But in this day and age in social media, it's great it's great that you can get stuff for your program out there, especially in colleges. It's great for recruiting and all, but it's just, you, you know, you used to have guys that would say all the time, I don't read the paper. Okay, that was good back then. Now it's almost impossible because you're on Twitter. You're on all these platforms trying to recruit kids. So at some, across your feed at some point. You are going to see someone say something. I mean, you give, me, you give me crap about it all the time. I get right on your feed as soon as you post something. And I believe you have a notification set. Every I time. don't have my notification set. It just so happens to be that on Twitter or Instagram when something pops up and you are promoting your school, um, I am always going to, in my own certain way, like it first and then uh, make the heel turn on a thread somewhere and throw a jab out there. But, uh, you know, you're talking about social media where everybody has access. Everybody's got an opinion and they want that opinion to be known and at some point, you're going to see it on your phone. You cannot hide from it. You can't do like you did 30 years ago, and I don't read the paper. Yeah. I don't. You can't hide from it anymore. You're going to see it, and it, it's just tough. The day and age of guys being at a place for 20 years is over. Um, it's just I don't think you're going to see it that much anymore. It'll be a rare case, but it's just too hard. It's too hard to police people. It's too hard when presidents change or, or athletic directors change. It's just too hard to keep the same vision going for a long time. And then when you do get good, I just told one of my assistant coaches, who's a Georgia fan, I said, get ready for this bowl game now, and you got to play Baylor, and get ready for this bowl game because you, you got to understand now that the expectation at Georgia is to win the SEC and then to win a national title. Once that's off the table, good luck with trying to get some of these kids motivated to play in that bowl game that Baylor is probably really excited to be in. Well, you've seen that with high school kids. Yeah. Once, you know, if, if they're out of a district championship or something, that it's hard to keep that focus, especially yeah. now, you know, in this day and age. But yeah. yeah you, you, it's, it, it literally is, you know, it's a factor at some places, and, and people talk about it at a lot of places, that you get to a point in the season where you don't have a chance anymore, and at certain places it's just impossible to keep kids motivated. If they are not self-motivated, 
if they do not have any pride in just what they're doing. If it's all about the playoffs or a district championship, there's certain places where the attrition, after the fact that you can't get to where you want to get, you just shut. It's just a shutdown. And especially if they haven't overcome. A lot of our kids have overcome adversity. And but a lot of them have. And a lot of them don't want to. They have it and they don't know how to handle it. And 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 dealing with it to understand how to make it a better situation through the adversity. You talk like we talk about it as coaches all the time. I talk to other coaches about it. Talk about handling adversity, and we talk about it here all the time. But when the lights come on on Friday night, and they're out on the field, and you're on the sideline, how they handle adversity is going to be out of your hands, and it's tough to, as a coach, it's really tough to deal with. And I imagine, as a principal, it's ten times as worse because you're over everything. You're over teachers and kids, and every problem is your problem. Here, football is my problem. I don't have to deal with everything, but as a principal, you have to deal with all that, and. Every time something goes wrong, it's going to be your problem. I've tried to set an alarm now where I got an alarm at 3.30 goes off to say to go home, uh, but it never turns off because you're, no. always, you're always worried about I got graduation coming up in two weeks. Yeah. You know, we have like 50 kids graduating there. Yeah. Uh, so, but I'm still, you know, I'm thinking about, you, you, just like a coaching, you think about, well, this could go wrong. What am I going to do here? Yeah. This is, you know, but, um, yeah, it's, it, you think about it all the time. Um, but it's a job. It's it's what you're. It's well, and it's, it's like anything if you're else. Passionate you're, about it, you're going to care about. You, it. It's like anything else that you're doing. All the what ifs come up, and you can think about all the what ifs all the time. But if you thought about those all the time, you just drive yourself crazy. Yeah. You know what if I do this? What if I do that? And you know. But I think that's okay. So now it's my. I was. I took over in the middle of the year. Right. As a principal. Now it's my at an alternative first. school, nonetheless. So yeah. you're at a school that's got even more issues than most of us because. Most of our schools that have issues, the kids that have a lot of the issues are being sent to you. Yeah. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, like, you know, kind of – I got to see it with kids that came from here to there. Yeah. And kind of see – I got to see the whole thing full circle. Um, but a lot of what it, – it's surrounding yourself with people that – Yeah, trying to find good people. people you yeah. trust, that you know they're going to – you know, it's a lot easier when, when I know that, you know, I've got my, – my assistant principal was – you know, it's phenomenal. He's, you know, I hired somebody that had more experience than I did. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's good to it's good to sit there with him sometimes and, and hear. He was also on a really, really good football staff. Yeah. He and he was, was well-trained. <laughs> but it's good, it's good to see, you know, it's good to just know, like, I don't have to worry about that right now. I don't have to try and take on everything. You know? But you still do. Don't tell me you don't. I do, but I'm, I think I'm doing a better job delegating. And, and we, you know, I get this in football all the time, and, and – I am slowly trying to, to get to a world where I delegate more and do less. But at the end of the day, my name's in the paper, my name's on the docket. If I have to do a lot of work for us to get the product out that I think we need to get out, I'm going to do it. I, I know that it's not the, the, the right way or the perfect way. I know that as a leader, you have to eventually delegate stuff. But when you first get to your school and there's, it's not your people there and you don't have the help maybe that you think you need, you're going to do it all because what else you can do? Fail? No. There's no. It's not an option. Nothing you can do. It's not an option. So I think building around hiring good people and hiring people that you can trust to do a job, um, you know, obviously is very important. But you get to that point and now you're the principal. Now the whole thing, like being a head coach, the whole thing's on your plate. Your name's on a docket. They don't put the they don't put the JV offensive or defensive coordinators. In no, it. our stats and coordinators they don't really it. go. Yeah. They don't go in there, and most people don't yell their name from the stands. It, you know, it's normally one name, and you're that guy. True. So run the ball. Run, run the ball. <laughs> and, um, graduate all these kids now. So you get into that role. It's a step up from being an AD. Now you're a principal. But at the same time, you're still working your way up because there's, you know, there, it's almost never really an end game, but at some point, there is, all right, I, I'd like to get here. So at some point, I think you want to be a high school principal at a school that has athletics because you've been an athletic director. I think that's fair to say, Tom. Yeah. So at some point, you want to work your way back to that. So talk about, and, and we touched briefly on it, you know, social media. Mm -hmm. Advertising and getting and marketing out there, the, the great things that you've been able to do that are helping change a place and how you're going about doing that using it in the right way so i was never on instagram uh before i 
Well, I'll, I'll let me kind of rewind to it. Did you get on Instagram to follow your junior high daughter? Or? Yeah, I'll get back to it. Let me start. I had Facebook when I was younger. Uh, MySpace? I did have a MySpace, yeah. I missed I, that. Tom, I'm bringing it back. MySpace is coming top, back. More top five words. friends. Anyways, I had a MySpace and I had a Facebook. Um, and then, I mean, honestly, now I would not be on Facebook if it wasn't for, you know, using it for school or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But then I got into Twitter. And then the, and I got into Twitter because I had some kids in my sixth period leadership class that made, like, a, a Twitter of crap that Aftuck says. Nice. In leadership class, yeah. Nice. So I actually took that over. Um, I don't know if I still have the stuff on there. You guys can. You don't, because I'd find it. You probably yeah, be on there. But I took that over and I started looking. I mean, Twitter is is instant information. You can see, you know, unbelievable. You know, I follow like ten beat writers for Florida. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I follow a bunch of wrestling guys. I follow you know you, just anything you're interested in. If you want to know about it, you can find you. Here's the only you can find here's it. the only problem with Twitter. You got to figure out real quick what's real. And, yeah. And what isn't? You know, like last week. It, a couple people got a couple big, major people got duped with Mike Leach being hired at Ole Miss. There was an account that was almost identical to another account that people trusted, and it got out that Mike Leach was hired at Ole Miss. And a relatively big football site actually posted and ran with it and got. So you got to be careful a little bit with like what's well, real. That's the problem with the instant information. These yes. things are like a ticket. I tell kids, it's like a, it's like a nuclear bomb at your. Oh, shout out Evan Sharp to text me. Yeah. Uh, hey. It's like a nuclear bomb in this, your hands. This podcast you is going say, nowhere. You could say you could say something. I could say something right now that would get me, you know, get me in trouble. Yeah. Anyone. And the other thing we try and explain to kids all the time, and I try my best to make sure that I'm not doing it, is you know, a like or a retweet is like you said. It's an endorsement. It's an endorsement of something, and, and we tell our kids all the time. And kids say, "Well, coach, I didn't, I didn't, I just, I didn't say that." Yeah, but by liking it or retweeting, it's it's an endorsement, so it actually is like you saying. Yep. So then I got so I got Twitter, and then I become athletic director, and start to see you start to see kids are using it more. Yeah. And and we had a big, um, you know, like a back and forth on Twitter, a couple different uh, schools back and forth, talking of crap before a football game yeah. or whatever, and it turned into it turned into something we had to address. Yeah, so at that to. point, uh, at that point, I'm like, you know, we have got we've we've got to show these kids. We got to, we got to teach them. Yeah. Just like you know, if you're trying to run something new, you're trying yeah. you got to teach them how to do it. You got to practice it. So how to use social media. Miss Pickett, her daughter was a uh, or still is. She plays professional soccer, but she was at FSU, and they did like a um, almost like a uh, orientation for yeah. athletes when they yeah. come in. So we started doing that every summer, uh, summer like how we call it our athletic seminar. And one of the topics was social media. And I actually would, I would teach that section. We had kids come in and do a little, you know, 30-minute blocks. And we talked about social media. We talked about, you know, what you really, exp you want to be you a know, real college recruiting, not just, you know, putting that stuff out on yeah. social media. Just So I, it was nice to learn with them, uh, with the kids. And now it's evolved into, you know, I've got Instagram because yeah. kids are on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, adult parents are on Twitter. Moms are on Facebook or whatever. Yeah. I mean, you've got to now. You have to know exactly your target audience, uh, and I think, I think you do a pretty good job with that as well. It, uh, you're 100 percent correct there because we. I'll give you an example. My my uh, my defensive end is going to sign with Liberty. Doesn't really want to do a ceremony. He's going to sign early December 18th. Yeah. He doesn't want to do a ceremony. That's just the type of kid he is. And I had to tell him today. I said, No, we're going to do a ceremony. I said, You don't have to switch hats. You don't have to do anything crazy. Do they still do that. They have yeah. Oh yeah. They, yeah. So. You don't have to do anything crazy like that, but we need to have a ceremony because I need it out there that a kid from Orange Park signed a Division One scholarship. That's just the way it is. When recruiters come in now, one of the first things you ask is, hey, coach, you got your card. Or are you on Twitter? Because the first thing you're going to do when that coach leaves, first thing you're going to do is you're going to put out on Twitter however many you have. So I have a Coach Mac. I have a Florida high school football chat one that I run. And then there's an Orange Park one out there. And you're going to put that out on every social medium that you have because – I need people to understand that Orange Park athletes are being recruited, signing scholarships, because that's a big part of what we do nowadays. Mm -hmm. So as a principal, you need to reach all the demographics of the people that might see what you're doing, on top of county people and other people, but parents. and other, You need to reach as many different demographics and figure out what demographic is using what platform so that you can get on all those platforms to make sure that you are reaching everybody you need to reach because that, that's why you're doing it. It's... It's self-promotion, but it's got to be done. The way I look at it is you're going to find out. People are going to find out the negative. Yeah. They're going to hear about that. I, what I wanted to do, what I do with social media now is I, 
we have a student of the week yeah. every week um, from the three different schools I have within my school. And it's something that kids, you know, the kids are competitive. They want it. Yeah. Um, so, we, you know, I, I put that out there on social media. That was like one of the first things I did. We put out what we're doing there. Um, we created Elevation Academy through the county, which is a uh, that's for kids that are three or more credits, excuse me, three or more credits behind and below a two-point GPA. Right. Um, those kids before would, would have to, uh, you know, have to drop out, go get their GD. Now they're able to come in. I've got a phenomenal staff, um, Ms. Dubas, Mr. Anderson, Ms. Ms. Cobbs down there that, um, you know, they, they're able to, to get these, they're able to just get so much out of these kids and it's because they see that success. So we promote that through uh, Instagram, use Twitter, Facebook. So it's just, it's trying to put out the, you guys talk about out, outshine perception, yeah, which, is, not, which is great. Yeah. My, the perception of my school, when you mention my school to a kid, um, you know, first thing you're... Negative. It, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Negative. And, 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 and adults, and I've, listen, I've done it too, where yeah. I, I've said before at, at different places where I've said, like, hey, you're going to, you know, you'll end up a Bannerman. Yep. You'll end up a Bannerman, and then when they do end up there, well, that's a... That, we've got to do our best as a staff to show the kids that, that, you know, they can raise their expectations. You know, we've done a good job raising the expectations of school. I want to put it out there on social media so that, that people know that. Um, you know, and, and for me, my kids see it, my kids will follow me on Instagram from school and they, it, it's something they strive to do. If it helps a couple kids then it's worth doing it. Yeah. See, like, so the perception of this podcast is going to be that you're six foot four and I'm five nine. When the reality is I took the broken chair to sit a little bit lower. Is that better? <laughs> it's probably worse for the podcast, but you know, I appreciate it. But, uh, you know, perception versus reality was actually something that I started at my first job. Had a lot of success winning games, going to the playoffs. Still couldn't get kids that were in my school zone to come to our school all the time when we were doing some really good things. So it started off as perception versus reality. Just so happened one day that I figured out that OP, Orange Park, outshined perception. Came to me one day, I put it in a hashtag on Twitter, and you know, just things like that that you're constantly trying to use all the different modicums and, and platforms that are out there to promote what you're doing because like you said you've got to change people's minds of what is going on because it is 100 percent natural for everybody to focus on the one percent negative mm -hmm. when there's 99 percent positive going on so i go into i try and go into a classroom every day and take a picture of kids doing what they would be doing at your at right regular high and school what they're supposed to be doing junior high what yeah what showing that you know these kids are doing they're doing everything that everyone else is doing. Now it's my it's my job to get them back to their home schools or to graduate college with a so because to enroll in list or be gainfully employed. Right. So because on the news or somewhere else, the only thing you're ever going to see is the high school student that got arrested, the high school student that did something wrong, just said so, something on social media, or did whatever. whatever whatever it is. So for you to actually put out there on social media that hey, this is actually what's going on. In most of the classrooms, most of the time, we can't control everybody. Bad things are going to happen, but you know, people make it like 99% of it is is all this nonsense going on, and there's no good. When in reality, it's flipped. I brought in a doctor who graduated from Benjamin yeah. to yep. speak to the kids. I brought in. I'm bringing in Zach Baker. Um, okay, Clay. Who was a Clay, Clay, Clay and, and Duke. What there is a younger kid. He's coming back to speak to our middle school yeah. kids. Middle school is a tough. That's a tough age. For these kids, especially, you know, they get in trouble and they, and they don't well, know, they, they don't know what to do. There are kids that that get in trouble early and make it out. Mm -hmm. You know, they learn a lesson, they get back, they are remediated, they're where they're supposed to be, and you know, it's it's what a school like that is meant to be. It's what it's supposed to do, and you know, it, it in our society nowadays, you, you got to look at it. And say, there has to be somewhere or somebody out there giving second chances, or a major part of the population would fail because we've all, at some point or another, made mistakes or done some stupid things. I've, I've learned more. You know, third and four chances, I get it. Yeah. But as a football coach, I've always been critiqued, or people would always say, you're too player friendly. You give those kids way too many opportunities. And, and to a point, or to a fault, I can agree with that. But at the same time, you know, football and coaching and, and, and the school that you're at leading that school, it's a second chance and sometimes a third chance deal because a lot of those kids are going to make it if you give them second and third chances. Some of them may not, and it's on you, and you got to eat it. But they never make it if you don't give them a chance. No. And what you have to do is, is 
you've got to be able to empathize with them, number one. Yeah. But then, number two, you've got to find something to relate to those yeah. kids. And if you're up there, you know, yelling at them and hammering them for cell phones and what they did for being late, and then, you know, you're the guy sitting in the faculty meeting on your phone the whole time. Yeah. You're the, you know, Happens it, all the time. Yeah. And late to things. I mean, that's life. People don't just get fired because they're late to work one time. You know, and we can't do, we can't have those same things. Like for me with suspensions, um, a lot of my kids have, have been suspended, suspended, suspended. And then they know, like, they know they can do something to try and get out of school and get to sit home, play Fortnite yeah. or whatever. So I, I mean, I made the comparison, like, if I miss the gym today, I'm not going to suspend myself for three more days for the gym, you know, unless it's something, you know, unless. Unless it's leg day. You know, yeah, unless it's leg day or something. Like that. <laughs> you, know, you follow what I'm saying? Like, yeah. we're not, it doesn't make sense. We've got to find more ways to. Well, and that was, you know, that was always the deal with out-of-school suspension. Kids loved it. Kids loved it. Oh, OSS three days? Thank you. No, how about this? Sit in that room with ISS. They hate but ISS. On the, but on the flip side, then you have, you know, you, you've always got people that are look, that are second-guessing and judging you, just like on a Friday night. It's never going to never gonna change. So you don't even more, you know, great quote I heard from somebody last week. Don't ever, you know, don't ever worry about the opinion of someone you wouldn't ask for their opinion. So if it's somebody that you would never ask for their opinion, don't worry about what their opinion is. Yeah, why worry about the chief seats? Yeah, I mean, it, it, and you just, you take the job knowing when you get into the job, you know that that's what it's going to be, and, you know, there's really not much you can do about it. So, you know, one of the other reasons you're, you're first guest on the podcast is we share the same passion in professional wrestling. I don't know if I want to admit that, but yes, I do. Uh, yeah, it's perfectly fine. I, I, I do watch some professional wrestling. I enjoy it. I've been it's, to a couple of NXT shows, WrestleMania. So speak. A, so uh, speaking of that, it's a fun, a fun way to just debrief. Not even just you don't have to think. You just, just watch yeah. something that is completely asinine. Yeah. By the way, you know, in, in what is done, but then also appreciating that you know these guys are, you know, the, the, some of the best athletes in the world. No question. And what they do and, and put their bodies on the line is pretty cool. But it's a, but for. As I talk about it now, and we talked about it last week with Colby, and it's kind of an escape from reality for me. You know, it, it's it's an hour or two where I can sit down and watch something. I know it's scripted. You know, I I, I know what the results may or may not be, um, but at the same time, it's like my, you know, it's my sitcom. You know, it's my TV show. It's 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 my every week. Something that I pay attention to for the plots or the storylines or whatnot, but as we as we talk about that, you were at NXT shows before. It is what it is now. What's the what's the difference? Now I got to go to the second taping they had live, and it's I think it's the same. It's but the still, same thing. but still, when it was taping, two three weeks in advance or three. Oh, shows no, no, I went to the second live one this year. Oh, okay, when, when, it, when they, it's when actually it on, USA, on Wednesday, yeah. and it was okay. it was cool. It was really neat. one of my friends, Josh, is big into it. I got got to, to access some of that through him but he uh, those shows are just the, the it's like a, the crowd is a, is a part of it yeah oh yeah the NXT crowd is, is 100% a part of the show yeah and you could see that when there's like when the invasion angle was taking place and those guys were coming down but they are uh, one, it's just it's so unique because it's so intimate everyone's right there in front of you if you go to like one of the NXT shows up here they do in Jacksonville yeah. with the armory or whatever I mean, you could pay twenty bucks and sit front row. I remember you going to one of those shows, taking a picture, and telling me, "This guy's five foot nine. He looks six foot four on TV." Yeah, like one of the. I think it was the Viking Raiders. Yeah, or a couple, yeah. one of those guys where you th you look at him, and I'm I'm looking down at him. I mind you, I'm six five on this podcast. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just everything that goes into that, and now it's gotten into such a big business. With yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, you, know, you got the cons now. The yeah, AEW. AEW we right? talked so a little bit about options. it last week, and but and they've created this manufacture this whole like. Wednesday Night War, which is cool because... So, so let's, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. AEW goes out and wins the first six or seven weeks in ratings, right? Honeymoon, New Deal, everybody that's upset with WWE, you know, character storylines, whatever, whatever you want to call it. They're all interested in AEW. NXT wins the last two weeks, and it's part of the invasion angle. My take on the whole thing was... WWE is a product. It's a roster. It's one roster. Who cares who they put on NXT? It's still a WWE roster winning a ratings war over the AEW roster. It doesn't matter. And then you, the guys you have in AEW, you know, Chris Jericho, obviously. Huge fan. He's, he's, Everybody knows it. He was there at the, the I went to the little unveiling yeah, they had. When they did the unveiling here in Jacksonville. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And I've seen the Young Bucks and um, saw the Young Bucks Hardys 
in Orlando. Yeah, because okay, you were part of WrestleMania. Then. So I went to that. We went to that night. Well, the Ring of Honor show, right? The Ring of Honor show where the, where the Young Bucks and Hardys was really yep. cool. Uh, but one of the, it's just, you know, we've made fun of it on the on the thread, like, you know, yeah. Oh, lady, oh, oh my God! It's, well, guess what? The next comedy Gooker's music. Yeah. It, know, it, like, the next one's probably going to be either if Luke Harper got let go, the Ascension guy, or the Ascension, yeah, Victor or one of those guys. It's coming because as much as you want to hate or talk down on the WWE, AEW or TNA Impact or whoever it is, they know right away if they get a WWE star, mid card or curtain jerker, we put them over right away. And the crowd goes nuts because WWE couldn't do nothing with him, right? So I am a huge Chris Jericho fan. Chris Jericho will have to go down. Last week we did a segment, all right, and I'll ask you, I'll, I'll ask your opinion. Last week we did a segment, the Mount Rushmore of wrestling, and who would your four be? And Chris Jericho was not on my four originally, but then I started thinking about it after the episode, and the things he's done to change his character and stay relevant throughout his career are just absolutely phenomenal. But while I say that, when I watch him wrestle in AEW, it's 50% of what he used to do in WWE as far as in the ring. But his character and his gimmick and his mic work and everything else is phenomenal. But you can't, outside of some of the tag team high spot stuff, I can't sit there and watch that and have people legitimately tell me that it's a better product. Well, I think they've, take their, they've taken their best star and turned him into a jobber. Kenny Omega. Yeah. I mean, uh, you watch Omega versus. Uh, God, Mark, don't say that. What's the guys? What's the. Uh, Parker. No, the Omega Tana. The, the, two years ago, Rainmaker, Okada. Oh, Okada, yeah. Where they had like that hour yeah, match. Six star and, match with Meltzer. You know, it, it ends up being like one one winged angel takes him out. Now, I mean, at AEW, you get hit with 75 super kicks. And then you get rolled up, schoolboy you know, game. 15 uh, <laughs> tombstone pile drivers. Right. Uh, and then we got to roll up for the win. Roll up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's. that's that's a discussion for another day. How finishers of I, I think they no take, longer I think become they finishers Omega and turned him into. Uh, yeah, they have to have something down the line that they're doing for it, but it's absolutely mind-boggling to me because obviously the real, true hardcore wrestling fans know who Kenny Omega is. Everybody's known, but if you're not a, a wrestling fan, and I would tell people or I would use a GIF of Kenny Omega, and people would be like, "Who's that?" Well, look up New Japan and what he's doing in New Japan, and so you know, there's so many stars out there that are great wrestlers. Uh, great characters, great gimmicks, but as much as I love AEW for bringing WWE to another level, yeah, you know, I just can't sit there and say that the product right now is better. I, I can't do it. This thing is different. It's something different. It's different, which is great. It's well, an alternative. Orange Cassidy is not going to be on on SmackDown, <laughs> right? Just a guy standing there with his hands in his pockets. But Orange Cassidy does make me think that I might have a chance to make it. But I, I told you, like, you got to watch this guy's stuff. He is incredible. Yeah, He's you were one of the first ones to tell me about it. It is idiotic, but it is... And I looked it up in some gym yeah. somewhere with 500 people there. Oh, going nuts. Going nuts about the, the gimmick he's doing and everything else. And but then so, you've, got, you, you've got, like, your... Um, you know, what's the guy's name? Who's the, the Luchasaurus guy? Well, Luchasaurus is Luchasaurus. I don't, I don't yeah. know. But that guy, he's, he's, they're having some good success with him. Oh, yeah. Um, really like what um, you know, the Young Bucks are doing. Young Bucks, and we talked about this last week. I, I mentioned it. You know, the Young Bucks are great, innovative in the wrestling business. Too much high spot for me um, because I think that style, and you see right now, uh, Matt or Nick or one of them is out with a back injury right now, and I just think that that spot fest that, that I used to say all the time, people love NXT shows. Here's why, they, here's why they like them. They let the NXT guys do whatever they want because that's the developmental brand. Yeah. But the guy that signed for $5 million for five years, you're not letting him take those spots in WWE. There's no way. No. Not happening. Now they're getting there. You know, the Ciampa took that. Guy just had neck surgery. You see what he did? Well, falling out. You know, who, took the spot, who, took, who took the spot, Ciampa or... or Adam Cole, well, both of them. I I agree, I agree. But yes, just well, off the next surgery. Next surgery. Yeah. So twenty five. I, I feet don't. Cage lands on his as much as a fan. As, else? as much as a fan as I love that. I, I don't think you can survive with high spots all the time because those you, you physically your body can't do it. All right. So then let's go. You want to go back to AEW? Right. MJF, greatest heel maybe out there right now. Yeah. And they and they let that they developed that the right way. Developed it as a great character. They developed it through some of their YouTube stuff. Uh, being the elite, which is phenomenal as a YouTube guy myself. The content they created there is phenomenal. Guy's a great heel. I, I don't know. I watch him wrestle. I don't. He's okay. Um, you know, he's not, I don't think he's anything uh, 
remotely different, but he wrestles as a heel, and it's great. Yeah. And then they took the angle to make him Cody's friend when if you were watching... If you were watching the stuff on Being the Elite he was doing on YouTube, some of the segments they did, you know, they did a great segment on YouTube one time where Cody brings him in and introduces him to the Young Bucks and Hangman, and he, and, he, and he shakes their hand and talks about how happy he is to be there. Cody walks into another door and the door shuts, and then he tells them how terrible they are. He's taking everybody's yeah. spot. You guys suck. And then Cody walks back, and he goes, hey, guys, thanks for everything. He takes a drink, spits in it. So they were building him to be a heel. His character is a heel. He's a Long Island guy like myself, so I appreciate seeing a kid from... Plain Edge or Belmore or wherever he's from that area, but he's um, not doing all the high spots. He's not. He's just wrestling. No, he's just a heel. Yeah, he doesn't have to do those. Heels have never really had to do that. They they wrestle heelish by nature. Ric Flair's the best one ever. You know they wrestle that way by nature. But the problem we're getting into now in the wrestling business is nobody knows who's heel and who's face anymore because heels are getting cheered beyond belief. Faces can't get over that they want you to get over. And then there's spots during the match where faces wrestle like heels and heels wrestle like faces. It's crazy. Well, then you've got the best. The best character in WWE, they've turned him into a, uh, you know, is he a face? Is he the Bray Wyatt? Right? Well, I think what they're going to try and do, if you ask me, potentially, is I think they're going to have a Bray Wyatt wrestle and a Fiend wrestle. And split up. Split up, and then down the road, you know, obviously they can't wrestle themselves, even though the WWE tried that at one point with The Undertaker wrestling The Undertaker. Uh, WCW did it with a fake Sting. That was. But that was a great angle when it all started because that's when Sting left for the first time because the fake Sting jumped Luger and then everybody thought it was the real Sting. Well, maybe they got Bo Dallas you know, growing his hair out and, and gaining some weight. Yeah, it could be. I don't know how you're going to find it. Obviously, apparently from what I've heard, they're going to put tattoos on somebody that's built similar, try and make it look like it's actually Bray Wyatt wrestling The Fiend. But that's just all wrestling talk on pages that are wrestling pages. This one is not. I just happen to love wrestling. But yeah. That, that's the deal. You know, do you boo the Fiend? Do you cheer the Fiend? I really don't care whether you boo, cheer, don't care. It's, it's one of the best gimmicks out there right now. Don't care what they do with it. Hell in a Cell was terrible, I agree, but I, don't, I didn't care one bit. Everybody said they're going to kill the Fiend. There's no way. That character is not... No, it makes too much kill. money. Makes, not only does it make too much money, but it, it's too good. Yeah. It's too good. So, are they, you know, are they trying to build them like, you know, Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees? Maybe. But guess what? When The Undertaker was on the, the Broken Skull sessions with Stone Cold, and Stone Cold asked him how he developed the character, and The Undertaker said the hardest thing for him to do was slow down, mm -hmm. build it to a crescendo, because he was this high-flying guy that was really talented and athletic. He, he had to, for, it would be the same thing for somebody like me with that gimmick. I'd have to slow down my delivery, how I talk, to be that character. Well, you know what he mentioned? He mentioned watching Friday the 13th and Halloween, and watching how... Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees never really ran after anybody, but yet they always got there. And that was how he built his character, and that's what the WWE is trying to do. They're trying to make The Fiend this supernatural, larger-than-life thing, but like you mentioned it the first time, and I agree with you 100%. Okay, now how do we, how do we pin him? It's interesting, but how do they do it? I don't know where they're going with it, but The Fiend right now, I, don't, I think Bray Wyatt, from an intellectual standpoint, Bray Wyatt right now is as good as anybody out there. Because a lot of these ideas, when you go behind the scenes, were his, I believe. Yeah. And a lot of time, he put a lot of time and effort into that character. So, um, you know, it's interesting, and, and wrestling's a passion of mine. I know it's a passion of yours. So, just wanted to take some time, you know, to to, to talk about your thoughts. Because I knew you were going, you were going to NXT before I really even knew what NXT was. You were going to shows, and you were telling me you've got to drive down there and see these. They're unbelievable. Yeah, it's cool just because they're right. It's in Orlando. You know, it's a pretty cheap tickets. Yeah. And small crowd, small crowd, but it's pretty. You know, you watched me the entire. You, yeah, I was. You got on TV, and we now have. TV. I can't. I haven't figured out how to make it into a gif yet. The clapping. If I was smart enough, we have a picture of you clapping during a match with a New Day shirt on, and we still screen and took a picture, and that 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 now goes out in several threads. If you say something that I think is good, the clapping picture is going out. If if you get mad at me when I make the heel turn, the clapping picture is going out. It's got several meetings, but it's going on. That was you on. That was you on TV. Yeah. With the new day shirt. Kind of Just standing there, hand, arms crossed, clapping. Yeah. So, now, building on from that, big Gator fan. Yeah. I'm, All right. Direction of the program. Good. I'm excited. I mean, I know we got to beat Georgia. Until we do anything, we've got to beat Georgia. And get to the SEC championship. That's got to yep. be first. Yep. You got to beat Georgia. You got to get there. I, I thought this year we had a pretty good chance. Uh, Georgia's a very talented team. Yeah. Um, they, don't, they don't necessarily play football probably the way you like or I like necessarily when it comes to 
Yeah, I mean, they play defense the way I like. Um, but I'm talking offensively. Offensively, it's different. But you know what? I'm starting to find out with I, – I do things in high school the way I do them because with 22 years of experience, I'm kind of st- – trying to figure out not only what works, but what's easiest for kids. Like, I have this conversation with people all the time. Uh, one of the guys you just mentioned, Evan Scharf, some other guys that are really, really bright guys. If you're the coach that wants to mark or last, and you want to have all the adjustments to all the scenarios of everything that might happen on a play, can high school kids handle that? No. So, not, do not we, unless you've got, the, you know. Do we really need to be doing those things? No. You know, that that's the question. So, well, um, we, well, we had this whole process with hiring you. Uh, yeah, was one yeah. of the things that I looked at, that Clayton looked at, was you know you, you're able to adapt to talent. Or was the, you have. at the time the way you guys had watched me play? Could I do it here? Yeah, that was that was part of the question. And, well, and, I, w- I would watch it originally because you would take you wouldn't have the you had Ramsey. Yeah, we had some we had some good, we had some good players at times. You took but, some some you would you know you cut down your splits on your on yeah. guard tackle. You would go quick. Yeah, you know, you do different try things. Try to use, you know, try to get into tempo. Before other guys were doing it, you know, you got you would do that and, and try and work that. And um, well, that's the problem now with social media and, and the way things are now. I don't think there's anything out there now that nobody's. I asked somebody the other day. I said, "Hey, with with the podcast that I got going on, play fast football, YouTube videos, trying to build my own clinic. Is there something out there we could possibly do that nobody's doing to to really make a name for yourself? To, no, no." It, no, but that's that's social media in the market, and everyone wanted, you know back then all twenty two access to film. Fifteen years ago, everyone was the spread. The yeah, spread, which now everyone quarterback run read game. Now, if you got a guy that runs wing T, it's something different. You know, and we talk about that all the time as a quote quote unquote system. You know, guys argue about systems, and they get all bent out of shape when you don't talk about their system. Or is listen, you got to score points, you got to move the ball. I don't care what plays you call. I run, I run buck sweep in my spread version of offense, and that's a wing T staple. I don't care if it's wing T. All the read things that you see with the quarterback, are those all not option principles? Yeah, they may not be Army, Navy, flex bone, but they're option principles. Well, you can't do them. They're better from under center. They're better. You could argue that till the end of time. It goes nowhere. People just end up fighting. Bottom line is you got to score points. you got to move the ball. In college, the thing is you got to recruit. You got to recruit kids to play a certain offense. Do you have a better chance when you're running a certain offense? Yes, you do to get better athletes and better players. So I get it why you don't see. But then you've got Nick Saban, who's the greatest football coach of all time. Possibly. I I, I don't think he's, who's better. I'm talking uh, college football. I mean, college football. I don't know. You know, I, I don't what's know. Your right? Mount, what's your Mount Rushmore in college football? Then? That's, not, uh, that's tough. That's I mean, Bear Bryant. Uh, yeah, Bear Nick, Bryant. Bear Bryant. Nick Saban. Uh, you probably have who's to put Mike Price and who's the other Alabama <laughs> coach? In there? No, they're not all Alabama coaches, but uh, you know, yeah, Bear Bryant. You got to look at, I think, you know, what some of the Notre Dame guys have done, whether it be Newt Rockney or, you know, whether it be uh, Lou Holtz was at Notre Dame, did some good things. You got to look at Jimmy Johnson. You got to look at Bobby Bowden. You got to look at Steve Spurrier. You know, and there's so many, and there's so many others that I'm probably leaving off. Like a guy like Frank Broyles, you know, a guy. Uh, what about like Hal Mummy? That's yeah, yeah. How Hal Mummy what was the, what he's the the tree he has. The tree he has is phenomenal. And to this day, I asked this question to somebody today. I'm glad you brought that up. To this day, I don't even know if anybody really knows what air raid is, because nowadays everybody runs air raid plays. Um, so I know it was a mindset, a philosophy, a pedagogy at one time. But like when you look at Oklahoma, Lincoln Riley. I just did this video today. Lincoln Riley is quote unquote air raid, right? They is is, they is, counter, is Oklahoma? Yeah. So, so we, we talked a little bit about that today, and we talked about you gotta you gotta move the ball, you gotta score points, you gotta do whatever you can. Dan Mullen did a great job this year. I am not a Gator. Everybody knows that. Um, had a player play for the Gators that I rooted for when he was there, but I have a hard time watching him. You are a Gator fan. Um, I think Dan Mullen did a great job this year because they took a quarterback that doesn't fit his system and out of necessity they threw the ball, and they're one of the top fifteen passing offenses in college football right now. So. Obviously, he did a great job. So the program is in good shape. Recruiting classes? I don't really keep up with it. I, Tough? I, I know guys around. I know. I don't really keep up with recruiting. Uh, I go, I'll look at you the You know you're probably top five right now, right? I think we're six. Six, maybe. Six yeah. or seven. But Georgia still guys like – they only have like 14 recruits or 15 yeah. recruits. I just think it's a matter of taking – you know, he took all those guys who weren't – I don't know what they, the recruiting class was with McElwain. Yeah. I think they were in the you know 15 to 20 or whatever. But those guys were all – you know, you got 
one of the best receiving cores in the country. Yeah. With Swain. You know, you got Grimes, you got Jefferson, you got, but he's brought these people. He's brought, he does a good job. Got to figure out how to use them. those transfers, how to use them. Uh, I think we got. He's got to figure out to do with Tony. Where they got, where they got stuck, in my opinion, is it switched offensive philosophy so many times. In college, you're recruiting kids to do certain things. When new people come in and change, those kids don't fit your things. So when McElwain comes in, he's going to try and be more of a pro eye guy, and he's going to try and do the things that he did at Alabama that were successful. So you recruit certain players. You know, you change, and, and Dan Mullen comes into a more of a spreadish quarterback run type deal, and you don't have those kids yet, yeah. and you still found a way, still found a way to compete and have a great season, ranked six, seven, five, eight, wherever they are, New Year's, New Year's six bowl game. So obviously, he's done a tremendous job. As much as people don't understand why I hate saying it, besides the fact that I do not like the Florida Gators, um, Dan Mullen was on the sideline coaching a game in 1994 where I was the MVP of the game. Caught a ton of balls, caught two touchdowns. We won the game. Have you told him this before? Yes. Yes, we had the conversation. Okay. We had the conversation. Um, I'm curious. You know, so there, there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a of a of a grudge there. And not on Dan Mullen, but he's now the head coach of Florida. And I've been bouncing around high schools my entire career. And and the one game that we were in on the same field together. He wasn't even a coordinator. He was a young position coach, and I had you know a, a great, great game. But it's all about who you know. It's all about your connections. It's all about where you go. He went. He he got on at Notre Dame. Just so happens, a wide receiver coach at Notre Dame was a guy named Urban Meyer. Mm -hmm. Pretty good choice. He hooked up with Urban Meyer. Went to Bowling Green. Went to Utah. Went to Florida. And such is life. It's it's opportunity, and it's who you know. But you can't you know on a podcast or on an informational setting. I can't sit here and say he's not doing a good job. He's doing a good job. He's doing a good job. You know, I'll turn heel and threads and. Nah, I like what he's done. I like what I, they put a real emphasis on special teams. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, you've got, you got to. You've got Michael P. Ryan, hauling, you know, hauling tail he, down there. Those guys got learn. Punts. I mean, that, that's that's huge. I'm not saying he was the first one to do it, but all those guys turn Alabama tape on, and that's where they learn. But you can do that when you have three five-star running backs. Yeah, but I think it's some a, people can't do that it because sets the tone, though. It sets the tone for your rest. One hundred percent sets the tone. But guess what? If I've got a stud running back and he's all I got, he can't run down on he kickoff. Will not be running down now. But if you got three five stars at running back, you can run that guy down on kickoff, and then they end up marketing themselves for the NFL. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it's okay, been huge so for the, the receivers. I'm excited about the direction of Florida football, but we've got to beat Georgia. Got to beat Georgia. We know that. Um, probably got to beat eventually LSU now. I don't know if it's still Alabama or is it LSU, but you got to beat Georgia on your side first to get to the game. Then you got to get out of the game because you find out that if you're not undefeated and you have a loss and you don't get out of the game, you're not getting it. So. Georgia's got to take it to another level now because they're that program. So, last segment now. Let's segue into the NFL. Jags fan. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. So am I at current point. I am a Jags fan, but I've been watching the red zone a lot this year. <laughs> so, here's, here's – talked about it with one of my players today in class. Your opinion on where do the Jags have to go? What do they need to do? I, there, there are people paying a lot more money – with a lot more knowledge than me, but I would say just you you're made, a fan. You, you they watch. Made, they made a mistake with Bortles. They put they went all in on that offense, which is not. They went exactly against what everyone else in the, in the NFL is doing, and uh, you know they had they had a good we had a good shot good shot at it. And uh, right now, I don't I don't know those guys did not look like they were playing hard yesterday. No, and you're at a point now where it's probably tough to play hard, and and I don't know where the coaching staff and and the and front office is going to be, but. Um, you know, obviously they missed on, on draft picks at the quarterback position, okay? Can't do that in the NFL. It's tough to overcome. Um, obviously they've had some really I would good say they, they have had – this has got to be the worst franchise drafting quarterbacks. Now, that's only because the, you study – that's you look at the number of, of team, number of quarterbacks yeah. they've drafted. Yes, but that's only because you're a Jags fan. The Browns? Wouldn't they have the worst? Well, I don't know if the Browns have a run of, of the worst. or but Okay, one, Browns are up there. What's our Mount Rushmore of terrible quarterback I feel quarterback like it would be teams? the Browns because they've gone through a lot of quarterbacks. Yeah, they got I'm not a big it. football person. A lot of guys have missed. The problem is you can't miss time and time again on quarterbacks. Now you're in an issue where you pay a guy $80 million to be your backup. Yeah, that's, 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 that's an issue. That's tough. So my idea, my thought was – the Jags are not at a point where one or two players take them over the edge. Should we call Smitty? This would be 
Yeah, this would be a good Smitty topic. He will be listening because he's my one best of friend who I've never your best met. friend that you've never met, but only through text <laughs> threads. But you guys will be at the clinic together and may have a session at 11.30 on Friday night. It's exciting. All right. So here's the deal. Are the Jags one or two players away? Absolutely not. Okay. So we're going to have the 6, 7, 8 pick, and we're going to get the Rams pick, right? Mm -hmm. So my thought was, why don't we go kind of the way of the Bill Belichicks of the world? We're not one player away. Probably not taking a quarterback after they took Minshew last year and now they signed Foles. So why don't we take one of those, and I would take the Jags pick that's probably going to be higher. I would trade that for value to try and get four or five second, future second round picks. We need to build a roster. One guy is not going to do it in my opinion. I think we need to trade one of those picks, and I would trade the, the higher pick. Because who's there at six, seven, or eight? No, you're not going to get Chase Young. You're not, you're not get getting Chase Young. Joe you're Burrow. not. You're not getting Joe Burrow. You probably not even may not even be in the market for Joe Bur uh, Burrow. Um, receiver wise, I don't know. I'm an Alabama fan. Judy's going to go. Judy's going to go higher, but I don't know if, if Ju I'm worried about Judy's size. Um, you know, probably need. You got DJ Chark, so maybe you have a red zone target back shoulder guy. Pick, 50, they 50 do not need to take receivers. They need to. CD Lamb would CD Lamb would be intriguing yeah, to me, good. but yes, I think you need offensive line. And you're not one offensive lineman away from winning. So my idea is we trade the best pick that we have, whether it be six, eight, eight. We take the Rams pick at 10, 12, whatever it is, and we use that. All right. And depending on the type of trade, maybe we trade back with the with the Rams pick to where we either don't have a first rounder or we have a late first rounder, but we end up with six, seven, second, so third rounders that we try. Year, yeah. Now, here's the problem with that. People that are true and true drag fans are going to say, well, what's the difference? We're going to blow those picks too. And, and do they have any faith in this regime? <laughs> Correct. Right Correct. So eventually it's going to come down to the regime. Eventually it's going to come down to who's making the evaluation, who's making the picks. But my suggestion, the play fast football method of how we're going to get better is, is we're going to blow it up and we're going to build a roster with second and third round picks because we are not one or two players away. No. Not, not even close. Or we go this way, outside the box. Just draft a quarterback every single round. You got it. Is one of them going to make it? One of them has got to make it. Okay. And you got Minshew on the roster. You got just a quarterback every single round. Take with Minshew. Do you, what do you do at Foles? Huh? What do you do at Foles? You have a, the best ten man quarterback training camp. Because here's another thing I brought up. Some kid in my class said trade Foles. To who? We're not the, only the who. We're the only market for him. Not, not only the who, we but got the bidding war what, what in the world just happened to his value when you made an $80 million backup? If you trade if you trade him after he goes out there, they should be playing on them. And, yes, and, yes, yes, and yes. Run an air raid and trying to do whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah because now you've diminished the value of a Foles. If you trade Nick Foles, what value is there for Nick Foles? How, how can you not be excited about Minshew with what we've had in this? You know, just I'm saying as a Jaguar, Jaguars fan. He's brought something to the team. He's a little bit of a, a little bit of life. He can throw a spiral. Number one, that's important. He's, he's brought life to the fans. He's brought life to the franchise. The he guys. Cool. It playing. seems to me that the guys are behind him. Yeah, the guy. They, they want to play for him, but I think everyone else they're they're done. And if it, they quit on, but it, you've now you've now got yourself in a spot where Minshew's now the guy. Foles is not. I think Foles is still hurt. Just me. Uh, you know, it just doesn't look like collarbone, right? And throwing shoulder, I believe, correct. No, it was his left shoulder. I remember when he went down, but he's so still, it was the other shoulder. It's still uh, none of his throws to me. I mean, the guy didn't do what he did with the Eagles with no talent. No, and none of his throws to me look like a guy that did what he did with the Eagles. So I, what I, do you I do? Think with we him? have receiver talent. Obviously, Chark's good. Yeah, we have Diddy a Westbrook's pretty good. We have a couple. Um, Conley, I've never really been a big fan of his, but he's you know he's, he's that probably had the best year. Of Got some guys. Ever. Fournette's good out of the backfield. Yeah, a broken yeah. left clavicle. All right, so broken left clavicle. Producer Colby Grant just gave us the info, so not non non throwing arm, um, but still I, I still say he's something's wrong. He, he doesn't. None of his passes have zip. None of his pass, his long balls are all underthrown. He didn't get to where he is today, not having talent with the Eagles. So I don't know. Maybe the system's different, but we've got to come up with an answer. We live in Jacksonville. We watch the Jags. We need an answer. I, I've become. You've been an AD, a principal. It's your job to fix these things. Bring Cody and the Young Bucks. A they did that already. No, bring him in as, a, as the executive vice president's in charge of uh, football, too. Okay, but while we They're do that... they only rest on one day. Let, yeah, but let's go back and talk about that. 
let's bring him in because we don't like how all the older talent and how the McMahon steal all the spotlight at WWE, but let's bring them in and give them all the first title shots. And then let's bring in a 63-year-old Ricky Morton to do spots in a pay-per-view. But if, if oh, w I left out Canadian Destroyers. Yeah, yeah Canadian, Canadian Destroyers. Seven Canadian 17 Destroyers. Canadian Destroyers. And maybe uh, uh, the one that, 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 that Ali does and all those guys do the... the 727. No, no, the Tequila Sunrise or the Sunrise off, oh, the, yeah, off yeah, the top yeah, rope. The, um, shoot, Spanish Fly. Spanish Fly off the top rope. So, you know, maybe that, but bring them in to be management. And then next thing you know, they're actually going to be playing running back and receiver. I think you've got to do something different. You have to do something different. There's nothing different in the NFL. It's 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 the hardest market. The talent is almost even everywhere. There's I nothing. watch. I like watching. I had Kyler Murray on my my uh, fantasy team. I like watching what they're doing. Yeah. Because it's different, and it's not. You've got a five nine quarterback. Chuck it. Greg Rome. What Greg Roman's doing with the Ravens. Greg Roman. And, and 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 Lamar Jackson is different. But you don't have. Who, how many Lamar Jacksons are? There? Well, clearly they, they didn't draft him here. Well, I know they, a lot of teams passed on, but there's there's really right now maybe one Lamar Jackson. I don't see another one coming out in college. But you have to have you have to have the right personality. You have to have people that want they want to play behind it. But the pros are so different. It's a job. Yeah, the NFL game's the ultimate. And it's it the is. ultimate coaching. Uh, the line of scrimmage is way different. You know, everything yes. is just faster. Yes. At every level, the line of scrimmage is what wins and loses. But the the NFL is is the penultimate proving grounds for coaches. The talent, as much as we make fun of you know, the, the, the Jags are down right now, they're still not that far behind. They're not one player behind, well, but they're they not made, far. They made Phillip Rivers look really good yesterday. Yeah. Not, really good. So, you know, you, you just get to a point where what are you going to do? You're going to make front, you're going to make coaching changes. You're going to make front office changes. You know, what, what are you going to do? Something's, something's got to go on. Well, their, their Band-Aid this year was Nick Foles. The Band-Aid was Nick Foles. didn't work. I think that's also a big splash in free agency to prove that they can make a splash because they seem to not do so great in free agency making splashes. But, you know, I say you go the Belichick route. You just trade out upon trade out, stockpile picks, and then you got to evaluate right and get good players in the second and third round because the team, the, the roster is far from – being where it needs to be in the NFL. Nah, I gotta blow it up. Unfortunately, all we, right. We've so we've gotten so used to it in Jacksonville. Yeah, and the sad thing is, people have gotten used to it in Jacksonville. Made one or two good runs, but at the same time, everybody's used to college football, and the college football in this area has been so good for so long that nobody wants to wait. No, and it's fun. It's a way. What is my? I took my kid to a uh, Jags game a couple years ago. She fell asleep. You know, it's like what? <laughs> she fell. You, you try and build this fan base. And I follow a lot of guys on Twitter, like they talk about the forgotten, the forgotten generation of Jaguar fans. They've never, you know, there's there's a kid in this high school right now who's never seen the Jaguars. What? Yeah. Besides the, the one, on top of the transient one community, on top of military based community, on top of you know people that are my age, your age kind of, but my age and older. When we grew up there, there is no Jags. So I grew up a Dolphins fan. I was born in Miami. There's no Jags. So, I, I mean, so there's I'm, no. So you had all these transient people. Our friend, our buddy's a Cowboys fan. Our buddy's a Redskins fan. Why? Because they're older guys that had teams before the Jags. We have a buddy that's an uh, not a buddy. Uh, uh, well, my one of my friends. One of one of your well one of your friends that's an acquaintance <laughs> is is an Eagles fan. Yeah. Um, and you know it. Jacksonville, it, it doesn't have a home base, really. You have all these older people that are fans of other teams. They're not trading off to the Jag Jags, and then the younger kids, like you said, have never seen anything good. Nah, and, and kids are, kids would rather play Fortnite right now and do those. They don't watch football like they were. No, they were. no. So, last segue, last topic, because brought it up in in the last podcast. Allison Chains fan. I'm, I'm a little bit of an Allison Chains fan. Okay. Not a Mount Rushmore, but go to number one Allison Chains song. Oh man, that's a tough question. I I, I like their newer stuff. It's pretty good, but you got to go back to Rooster, Down in the Hole, all the '90s stuff. It's pretty good. So we're not we're not going nutshell. Not, well, nutshell's pretty good. Depending on depending on where you are in your life and, and what's really going on. If it's on. rainy out. If it's you know, rainy out, you're in a dark place and it's not happy hour, it's sad hour. It's yeah, that's that's a good but they have, it's they were I like what I like Man in a box. What I liked about Allison Chains was you had two di you just different. You had the two distinct voices. Yeah, oh yeah. A yeah. lot of people a lot of people that if they're not real fans don't even might not even know when Jerry Cantrell sings. Yeah. And then you know, I, it's very distinctive because Lane Staley if you has watch the 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 Alice in Chains unplugged. Oh, it's a problem. And, and, but seeing how, what, and what a dark, bad place Lane Staley was, yeah. that they were able to carry him through that. And, and then, and then, you know, you never, I never paid attention at the time growing up. 
and than I did when they all died. Lane Staley's, the Chris Cornell's, the the uh, Chester Bennington and guys like that. Go back and listen to some of those songs, and I'm like, how do yeah. we not? How do we not know that this that guy makes was? Sense. How do we not know that this guy was in a bad place? You know, I think I was just singing the lyrics when I was younger, and it was cool. And then at 47 years old, sitting down, you know, after a round of golf with somebody, listening to touch tunes, and I start thinking to myself, yeah, th this guy probably was trying to tell somebody. You know, there were some signs there. Yeah, even you know, even a song like "River of Deceit" with Mad Season. Yeah, I mean, if you actually listen to the lyrics, you know, it, it's kind of like, yeah, this guy was headed that way. So we're not going. We have no. We have no number one. It's hard to do. It's hard to pick. I can't just pick one. It all depends on, the, on your where you're at. Your mood. Am I in the gym? Am I here? Am I there? Am I driving? Gym sometimes. Driving. I listen to a lot of podcasts, um, or now I'm like I'll go on. Uh, You're now a guest on a podcast, by the way. I am a guest on a podcast. It's been fun, by the way. Thank you. But uh, you know, I like podcasts. I like going to so or watching. Like I watched the Watchmen show. I don't know if you guys have, have you checked that out at all yet. HBO. HBO. Yes. I'm watching that, I'll, I'll get on the treadmill run and watch that. Um, but it's and it is, there's some cool. There's some really cool stuff. There's so much. So big much big Universal guy, not a Disney guy. Not a Disney fan. Okay, not that's Disney last fan. time you'll be on this podcast. I'm sorry. I love. I like. I don't appreciate like, your I don't opinion. Like Magic Kingdom. Appreciate your opinion. Epcot's fun, but I don't think they've. But I'm segueing. Go ahead. You're also with somebody else in this room. Big Marvel DC Comics guy. Big big superhero. Yeah, I like I like Marvel. I'm not a big DC guy. Okay. DC Although I watch the the Washington's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen the actual movie? It's not that good. I mean, I like I like the shows. I didn't. I don't like the movie because I don't really. I didn't really should, watch. Should watch a producer movie. behind the scenes be able to talk on camera? Yeah, yeah, I just I should be on the mic though. It's almost like the Dan Patrick show. You're behind the glass somewhere, and I'm asking you facts. <laughs> like of, of you're the guy behind the glass, and you look it up on the computer. Well, I'd go watch the Avengers with my daughter. We watch every single one of them, so that was kind of cool. Here, here's a question, because I don't want to yell. I want them to hear me. Okay. Okay. There's three uh, movies coming out next year. They're all led by women. Spice know. Girls. No, no. Okay. So you have Birds Black. of Prey, mm -hmm. you have Wonder Woman, trailer dropped yesterday, and then you have um, Black Widow. Black Widow. Which one do you think will, obviously we know which one's number-wise is going to do better. Wonder Woman, right? Yes. Yeah. But okay, give me the three characters, please. I know who Wonder Woman is. You have uh, <laughs> uh, Black Price. Widow. Black Widow is the character, right? Yeah. And who plays her in? Uh, Natalia. No, what's her real name? Who would? Uh, who who plays the character? Yeah, God, play? if you are still listening to this, I am so sorry. Who, what's her name? Whoever Scarlett Could, Johansson. Yes. Okay, so here's what I'm going to tell you. That movie has a chance. So we have Harley Quinn though, plays by oh uh, Margot, Margot Robbie? Robbie. Yes. Okay, so who's she? Birds of Prey. Yes. Which is which character? Harley Quinn. And like okay, Robert all right. So Harley, Harley Quinn is the character. Yeah. So they're introducing other women-led superheroes. It's okay. kind of like it's a woman version of Suicide Squad. I got you. I get. That's what Birds of Prey is. Yes. Okay. I, I got you. I'm going. Wonder Woman is going to be the best movie. Birds of Prey. I think based on nostalgia, Wonder Woman will probably do the best because every not, genre. Well, animal. the first one was good. The rest well, of I, the, and, a lot of the DC stuff is not good. But I, I mean, you probably would disagree with me on this, and he always just makes. Jokes. I don't know enough about it. Yes, my favorite DC movie is Batman vs Superman. I thought it was okay. I the like, way they shoot, they shoot everything so close up, and it's so... I, I like that. I felt like Marvel always got repetitive. Like, it started off really good because, it, you know, it's, it's new. Yeah. But then it's just kind like, of, okay. It's I felt like at some point this was my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, you have some Marvel, okay. Okay, but so... Yeah, no, uh, okay, out of all right, so you, yeah, all right, so you got me caught up. You got me caught up, on, you got me caught up <laughs> on Birds of Prey. You got me caught up on Margot Robbie, if that's her name. <laughs> Robbed or something. Black Widow has a chance because it's Scarlett Johansson. Yes. So think about the male demographic. Think about who's going to watch movies. Black Widow will have a chance because most people will watch Scarlett Johansson. Yes. All right. Wonder Woman will have the best chance because Wonder Woman is a character that people can relate to going back 30, 40 years or whenever the, the like even origination even of Wonder Woman. Movie I think Birds of Prey has a shot because Suicide Squad was... So, you know, Harley Quinn I think is a great character. I think there's going to be a wrestling character in the near few months coming up that will be based off Harley Quinn. I think it will be Liv Morgan, and I think it will be with Bray Wyatt and The Fiend. Yeah, she was already doing it before, I think. But. Yeah, kind of, but not, not in that dark tone. Yeah. Um, so I think all three of those have a shot. Will I see any of them? No. <laughs> have I watched, have I seen parts of any of the Avengers? Yes. Have What's I watched the last time you went to a movie in the theater? 
Uh, it probably had to be something with my kids, but this is this is. No, I mean, like the last time you were like, man, I'm gonna go see this in the theater. It, before, not Frozen Two or what, just something. Jeez. Pretty Woman. Really? Yeah. Wow. Not a movie guy. Never been a movie guy. Don't really like it. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't like movie theaters. I don't like sitting in movie theaters. Uh, just not. I, I don't know. It just doesn't appeal to me. I don't. You know, I'll. I'll I'll make a heel turn on people that like movies, but at the end of the day, we talked about this last week on a podcast. I, I, at the end of the day, behind closed doors, I don't knock what people like. I'll I'll throw jabs at what people like. I'll try and you know I'll try and be contrarian to what everything likes. It's just my personality. But at the end of the day, I don't. If that's what you like, and you go go to the movies, watch it. Yeah. I'm not going. You're not going to Star Wars. There's no End Game. No Star Wars. There's no. I saw. Star Wars. Star Wars, what is it, like 12 or 9? Something yeah, like I, I can't even follow them anymore. That. The Mandalorian, I don't even know who that I is. I wasn't into that. There's a baby Yoda now that's a gif. I, I just can't <laughs> follow it all. I, I don't know. But, you know, hopefully all, all of you that are watching out there. Um, Disney's going to be okay. Disney will be okay. Uh, You're still giving them money for your Mr. passes. Mr. Martin Aftuck, uh, first guest on the podcast, Teacher, AD, principal, moved his way up the ranks, has done a very good job, hired me here at Orange Park. Uh, friends off the podcast as well. Uh, maybe not as much as the X and, X's and O's as you guys would like to hear, but I told everybody when I started doing the podcast, the podcast wouldn't be. You get all my videos. You've already heard X's and O's. You're going to continue to get those. Podcast wanted to be something different. I want to bring in businessmen. I want to bring in people that have made it from other positions and in the coaching world and in the education world he's made it from the classroom to being an AD to being a principal I call him the one of the fastest rising stars in the business right now I give him several jabs behind the scenes about what he's doing and where he's going um, but this is a faction it's known out there that this is a faction there are several kayfabe moments on text threads where you gotta understand where we're coming from but uh, I knew he'd be a good interview. I knew he'd be a good podcaster because he listens to podcasts more than I do. I'm brand new at it. But, Martin, I appreciate you being on the podcast. For time. Hopefully more than uh, Smitty and eight other people will eventually pick this podcast up. But uh, I think there's some good stuff in here. I think it was, uh, it was fun. It's unscripted. You followed along pretty good. You, uh, you know how to build into a topic without it being written down. So uh, I appreciate you being a guest. Appreciate you being the first. Well, I appreciate it. First guess. First guess on the play fast. You told everybody you thought this was a setup. I thought it was a setup. I so you I, thought you were getting jumped when you came in the room. I, I didn't know what was going on. But yeah. yeah, but it's not a setup. It's a real live podcast. We appreciate it. Uh, thanks to everybody that is checking us out on Patreon. Um, and uh, those of you that are on Patreon, uh, if you've probably already seen the YouTube site, check out Coach Mac on YouTube. Check out the Play Fast Football Clinic, www.playfastfbclinic.com. Is there any availability left? There is plenty of availability. I'm finding out as a business owner now that people are late to register to clinics. Uh, plenty of availability. Plenty of great rooms at the Embassy Suites. Rooms hold four people. 179 a night, which people think is a lot, but divide that by four. You get a made-to-order breakfast and a two-hour happy hour. Can I give you some props on this? Because I'll yeah. tell you, the clinic, you, you, you know, I've gone and I've, I've listened to Bobby Bowden speak, and you listen to yeah. all these guys speak, and, and, you know, they're able to do a lot of that stuff with, you know, the, the, the college caliber talent but when you yeah. you've brought in just a lot of guys that I have a lot of respect for like a Brian Braddock you got Joe you got all these guys that are throughout throughout all of Florida and Georgia wherever. we put it out on Twitter the other day 1610 wins between all these guys yeah. and that's not including me it's 1610 without are you them speaking at all or are you just I am I have a one I have a morning session it's probably more like a a, a uh, wrestling meet and greet than it is really a football session I didn't want to speak but my business partner made me um, but there's about 1,610 wins between all those coaches. If you add me in, we get to 1,620. Probably, what, 1,500 losses? Or is that yeah, yeah, but I have at least 10 wins. So we get to 1,620 if you throw me in. But now 12 state titles. Mike Coe just won another state title at Madison County. Buddy Nobles is playing for one this week, and Randy McPherson is playing for one this week. So we might be at uh, 14 state championships by the time. The lineup, you know, glad you brought it up. The lineup is by far as good as any clinic lineup you're going to get. High school speakers only, didn't want to bring college guys in. Embassy Suites is only a year old, beautiful, right on the ocean. Made to order breakfast, two hour happy hour. I don't, as a clinic, I don't think you can be. No, it's, I think it's a cool idea. I hope it's, I mean, I think you, it's you haven't registered yet. 
Uh, no, I have not. I Your have best not. friend Smitty is registered and he is a Patreon member. Jason Smith. I'm going to ask for it for Christmas. Okay, so hopefully we can get a registration and a room booked from you because I'm on the hook for rooms that i got to get booked. Okay, fair enough. So I'll see what, I'll see what Santa Claus says. Should I tell people MGF is going to be there or what should I do? I think you need to... Uh Keep doing what you're doing. I think, I think like you said, man, it's going to be late. People yeah, we just found out that I, we got some emails on guys, which was huge for us because word of mouth was only my, it was basically all my avenues. It was my social media, my YouTube, and I think we just had to get it out to more coaches in the southeast and Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, because in this area, I think it's going to be as good. I'll put it up with any Glazier, any Nike as far as the speakers. Yes, there's no big-name college guys, but they're cool to listen to at first, but a lot of their stuff doesn't relate to our game. So I think the guys we got that are talking about doing it, at our level is amazing and so check it out www.playfastfbclinic.com to register martin thanks again it's a pleasure buddy enjoy it everybody out there you won't play well till you play fast we'll catch you guys next time